Hello, I'm Andy Alabastro, Director of Coalition Relations at the Heritage Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome you to Advocacy for Better Civic Education. We'd like to welcome those joining us from our resource bank network, our closest friends and allies and conservative leaders. We are used to convening in person this time of year, but we're pleased to offer these substantive discussions and expert analysis through our digital virtual platform. We're pleased to again partner with the Fulner Institute, our colleagues that are focused on restoring confidence in America's founding values and principles and reinvigorating civic culture and our national purpose. We'd like to also welcome members of the public. Our public programs team has a full suite of robust programming, and you can always find that at heritage.org slash events. This session is being recorded. It will be posted online at resourcebank.org within the next 24 hours. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We want your questions and we encourage you to submit them throughout the session. And you can do so through the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. We also encourage you to identify yourself and your organization so we can recognize you. We're pleased to have with us a few very special guests and they will join us shortly. Our moderator for today's session is Angela Saylor. I'll now introduce Angela. She is the Vice President of the Fulner Institute at the Heritage Foundation. She is an executive with 20 plus years of experience. She has worked in corporate, nonprofit, and NGO leadership roles on national campaigns and has promoted policy through public sector positions at the federal, state, and local levels. We are thrilled to have her lead today's discussion on advocacy for better civic education. Conversation over to Angela. Thank you so much, Andy, and, and to my colleague, Bridget Wagner. Uh, we are so delighted and honored that you could join us today for an action-driven webinar on advocating for better civic education. You know, advocating for better civic education means standing for freedom and, li and liberty. President Reagan said it best, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. You know, study after study reaffirms that Americans lack knowledge uh, about the history of our nation, our laws, our form of government, and even the balance of power that we have here. According to a recent survey conducted by the American Bar Association, more than one in seven adults in the US incorrectly believe that the executive branch of the US government is more powerful than either the legislative or judicial branches. While slightly fewer than one in eight believe the judiciary is superior to the other two. Children K through 12 are bombarded with revisionist history and social justice education. We are all so familiar with Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, and more recently, the New York Times 1619 Project. As we approach Juneteenth this Friday, the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States, it is only fitting that we remember Freedom only benefits those who have knowledge of the law and their rights. On June 19, 1865, General Gordon Granger arrived from the Union soldiers, um, arrived with the Union soldiers in, in Galveston, Texas, and announced to the enslaved African Americans that the Civil War had ended and they were free. So for two years after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, African Americans in Texas were unaware of their freedom and continued to live in bondage. I am so excited uh, about our lineup today and being able to tackle the issues of having knowledge and freedom. I want to invite our distinguished panelists to the screen. Dr. Tom Lindsay, Elizabeth Schultz, Beth Feely, and Janine Turner. They are going to share with us the powerful work that they're leading to advance civics. Dr. Tom Lindsay is a distinguished senior fellow of higher education and constitutional studies at the Texas Policy Foundation. Uh, Tom has more than two decades of experience in education management and instruction. Elizabeth Schultz 
uh, is Fairfax County School Member Emeritus and uh, as, as an education and public policy expert, she was twice elected to the Fairfax County School Board in Springfield, Virginia. Beth Feely, a freelance writer and editor for various nonprofit organizations, including the Woodson Center, and serving most recently as the launch director for its new 1776 effort. We are so happy to have Beth with us. And Janine Turner, founder and co-chair of Constituting America, which works to inspire students and adults to learn about the United States Constitution. As you know, and I'm sure you're aware, Janine is an, is, is an Emmy and three-time Golden Globe nominated actress known to millions of fans for her role as Maggie, as, as Maggie O'Connell in the CBS hit Emmy award-winning show, Northern Exposure. Again, welcome to all of our guests. We are going to hear presentations from our distinguished panelists, but before we jump in, I, I wanna quote Tom Lindsay, who said to Forbes magazine, given our civic literacy, um, given, the, given the state of our civic lit literacy, it is any wonder that the growing number of college students see no reason to uphold the First Amendment. I want you to take a look at this video produced by the Texas Policy Foundation. We the people apparently know nothing about American history. A recent study by the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation found that only 39% of all American citizens can pass the citizenship exam. We went to the premier higher education institution in Texas, UT Austin, to find out more about the crisis facing American civic education today. So who really is the VP? Is Trump Trump's own VP? The world may actually just never know. Who is the current vice president of the United States? He's old. He's, he is old. And yes. white. He is white? That is correct. I just want to say Joe Biden, but I don't know why. He was our last vice okay, president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Pence. It is Mike Pence. You guys got it. Uh, Mr. Pence. Yes, he would be proud of you. Yeah. Who is one of your current senators? He's the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> oh, man. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm, is there like an A, B, C, D? Can I just, is there like there's an answer not. choice C? There is that I not. Just like win That's it down okay. C? No, we both live in New York uh, City. In New York? Yes. Chuck Schumer. Cruz and Corn. You got both. Right. Man, you're killing it. The two C's. What are the first three words of the Constitution? Come on. All these truths that, um, to be self-evident. That That's the Declaration of Independence. Just kidding. <laughs> we the people. Yes. We the people in order to establish a more perfect union. Wow, you guys could just list the whole preamble. <laughs> we the people. Yes. Well, UT, I only have two words for you. To learn more about how we can change civics education, go to texaspolicy.com. Tom, thank you for the great work that you're leading at the Texas Policy Foundation. I want to turn it straight over to you uh, to talk about the, the things that you're doing and the impact it's having. Well, thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here today. As you saw in that video, what we did, we went to the premier state institution in Texas. We wanted to see if the national polling on civic illiteracy applies to the students at the best state university in Texas. As you saw, unfortunately it did. And what we also saw in that video was an age gap. 39% of native born Americans can pass the US citizenship test, but 74% of native born senior citizens can pass it as you saw in the video but only 20% of native born Americans under the age of 45 can pass the test. Now, the test is only 10 questions, multiple choice. You only have to get six out of 10 right to pass it. The good news is that immigrants to this country pass it at a rate of 91%. And yet, 
only 20% of native born Americans under the age of 45 can pass it. And this is a test that any competent seventh grader should be able to get six out of 10 right on. One of the questions is, who's the current president? And all the 100 questions from which the 10 are taken are available on the database. There is no reason not to be able to pass this. So what to do about it? At the Texas Public Policy Foundation, we're taking a two-pronged approach. First, introducing legislation that would require the study of the founding documents for all Texas students, the Declaration, the Constitution, selected Federalist essays, the things that explain to us why we deserve to be free and why government should be limited. At the same time, with the generosity of uh, donors who are concerned about this issue, we've established the Texas Public Policy Foundation Summer Institute for High School Civics Teachers. We'll be doing that again next week. We bring teachers in from across the state. Of course, under COVID, we're doing it by Zoom. Uh, this summer, normally we bring them in and we spend a whole week of 30 professional development hours reading the Declaration and the Constitution in Tocqueville and the first Lincoln-Douglas debate so that students get a better understanding of liberty and equality and why we're entitled to government by consent and why we're entitled to rebel when government fails to fulfill the purposes for which it was instituted. Let me close by saying the stakes in this struggle couldn't be higher. It has been said, and rightly, that the philosophy taught in the classroom in this generation will be the philosophy practiced in the legislature in the next generation. That's why we're doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Um, really appreciate the, the insight that you shared. Elizabeth, you know, you have um, had such, you've spent such um, um, a, a lot of time with school boards. And we're looking forward to hearing about um, the, in, the hearing about your insight and, and, and really peeling back the onion so that we can see and understand uh, the working of school boards. Over to you. So thank you, Dr. Lindsay, um, for closing with that quote um, from Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it's amazing because my lead in quote was, you know, upon the subject of education, I can only say and view that only say that I view it as the most important subject which we the people can be engaged in. That's also Abraham Lincoln. And we, we are in a situation, um, obviously we're in a crisis. We, we scheduled this uh, webinar before we were even in a national crisis as we are now, but there was a civics education crisis in our country that has been brewing for generations. But truly civics education begins with civics participation. And I want you to think about the people that are in your family, in your friend circle, um, uh, acquaintances that you know, and how many people um, are on a school board, have run for school board, are on a committee or have been worked to get on a committee of a school board, um, have testified in front of a school board or are watching a regular school board um, meeting uh, in, in order to be engaged and understand how their taxpayer money is being spent. The problem is that we talk about education at a national level and how that civics, what we're seeing happening on our college campuses, what we're seeing happening in cities across the country as a, a product of what's happening on college campuses. And the problem is, is that we're prepping children for 13 years. There are 51 million children in K through 12 um, education in the United States. Uh, there are 90,000 school board members in over 13,000 school districts. Who is paying attention to what is happening at the local school board level? And it's not a federal problem. It's not even necessarily a state problem because the people who are deciding curriculum, who are deciding direction, who are deciding the origins of things like um, rewriting uh, history at, at the lower grade levels are the local school board members. That curriculum is selected and promulgated largely through some of the largest school districts in the country, um, Houston, Fairfax County, um, 
the 10th largest school district in the United States with 189,000 students is currently rewriting and their uh, their history education, and they've started in the fourth grade. Why have they started in the fourth grade? Because it's Virginia history is taught in fourth grade, and that is a way to eliminate colonialism, to rewrite and correct, correct right, with you know uh, fingers wiggled in the air as um, an emphasis, so that we're starting to see elementary students who were making a annual field trip to Jamestown to learn history saying, well, we're not going to do that anymore because some people are offended by that. When you have um, a U.S. senator say that slavery was created in the United States um, in the last you know, 48 hours, you do not have people, you know, you, we think that this is generational. We do not have an understanding at this level um, of how serious the lack of civics education is um, in our country. However, if we ourselves as individuals are not engaged in that local uh, school board meetings, local school board races, supporting candidates, becoming candidates, you no longer have a voice in what is happening. And it doesn't matter if you have children in the school system or not. Or not. Um, people who have their money in their local community are funding their local school boards. They're funding the selection of curriculum. They're funding the selection of textbooks. They're funding whether or not you're going down the route of a 1619 project. We just had a school board member win a race um, in November, and at her swearing in, not only did she swear in um, uh, as, a, as a regular mode, but she was holding in her hands Howard Zinn's book. What does that say about the philosophy that is going to happen in this generation that is going to be present in the next generation in our government? So I, I emphasize um, significantly things like Ron DeSantis, who has just said that he is going to have a major um, focus on civics education in Florida. So there is the possibility to elevate this to the state level and to work with your legislators. but. The civics education begins with civics participation in your own community. You must pay attention to your local school boards and you must understand that there is a um, very intentional effort to, to pull and rewrite history curriculum, not present civics education in the first place, or to present um, a very tainted view of what um, civics means in the United States and we're losing generations of children um, to uh, a side that um, simply does not want to present uh, values and civics education. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank Beth, you. over to you. Um, you know, Beth, Elizabeth has talked about uh, mm -hmm. local communities, but we can, we, can, we can drill down even a little further to the family and the role of parents. Uh, so, want to give you the floor to talk about 1776 and, and New True Work and the work that you're doing there. Oh. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Angela. Um, and Elizabeth, I, I would like to play off of uh, that statement you made about civics education beginning with participation. I, I can't echo that enough. Um, yes, as Angela said, I was asked to share a little about how I, as a parent, have become more civically engaged and have helped others to do so through, uh, one, a local group that I started called Nutrier Neighbors, and then as well, a national group that I helped form called 1776. So by way of background, about three years ago, a few friends and I banded together to address a very left-wing program that our local high school, Nutrier High School, had planned on the topic of race. Uh, Nutrier High School is located in the affluent suburbs north of Chicago, where many leaders of industry, banking, law, civics institutions live, um, and it is a bastion of what you might call limous uh, limousine liberalism. Uh, the race day that the school had planned was actually supported by many in the community, but it was indoctrination, it was not educational, and we felt that we needed to speak out to bring more balance to what they were teaching the kids. Uh, this uh, controversy ensued and it ended up becoming a national news story uh, that was covered even in the Wall Street Journal. 
So our little group of parents learned the hard way how valuable it is to have a network in place to deal with such situations. And so as an outgrowth, we formed Nutra Neighbors to connect conservatives um, and as well overall educate those in our community about what's happening uh, in schools and local government, much of what Elizabeth was just talking about. Um, and indeed, in the past three years, other situations have arisen, but now we have a mailing list of about 2,000 people that we communicate with about these issues. Um, we also hold educational speakers events so that we can inform people and um, so they can engage. So that is one of the ways that I have become more specifically active at a local level. Um, another outgrowth of that fateful school race day was a connection that I made as I tried to bring alternative speakers to the school uh, for, that, for that event. And one of the people I called was Robert Woodson of the Woodson Center. Uh, Bob Woodson is a veteran of the civil rights movement and has spent the last 40 years addressing poverty, but with a very entrepreneurial mindset. And Bob and I found that we shared a deep concern about this grievance-based narrative on race, particularly, that seems to permeate our media, our academic institutions, our culture in general. And um, just this past year, I was blessed enough to help him launch 1776, which is a group of mostly black uh, scholars, authors, and grassroots leaders from the inner cities who are giving voice to the notion of resilience as an alternative to the grievance-based narrative. So 1776 produces thought pieces, op-eds, um, and we also present um, examples from the past and present of, of achievement against the odds. And these model American values and principles. So these are actually models of, of good civics. And um, the country really needs to hear from these voices, which include people such as Shelby Steele, Clarence Page, John McWhorter, Coleman Hughes, uh, Will Riley, Ian Rowe, Carol Swain, and others. And we are also going to offer school curriculum uh, which will help kids see that while slavery was a horrific chapter of American history, there are also many inspiring stories of overcoming and that the complete story, particularly that of black history, uh, includes both. So I guess I'd just leave you with that. The main lesson that I learned uh, with civic engagement is that you do have to speak up. Uh, this, is, this is your duty as a citizen. I echo Elizabeth's call show up at school board meetings, uh, become a school board member. Uh, the, this is your community. These are your kids. Uh, you do have that responsibility. And then I'd also say that, uh, you know, your involvement in a little local issue just might lead to your involvement in a big national movement. Um, so, and we need that to happen uh, in multiple places with multiple people. So, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much for, for even being an example of, of how you get in and roll up your sleeves um, and, and advocate for your kids and your community. Janine Turner, we're gonna, we're gonna go to you. Uh, you've taken your passion, you've taken your um, accomplished career uh, to, to, to straight to the hearts of kids. So could you give us more information about Constituting America? Janine, we, I can't, we need to, your mic is off. <laughs> oh, there we go. There go. The, actress. <laughs> the actress couldn't figure that out. Okay, well, anyway, uh, on the set, other people are dealing with sound. I just talked. Okay, um, hi, I'm Janine Turner, and it's an honor to be with on this prestigious panel today and all the wonderful things everyone is doing and to be with your wonderful organization. So thank you for this time. Yes, in 2010, I founded Constituting America. I had co-president with, uh, Kathy Gillespie and I are co-presidents. I called her in 2010 in the grocery store with my 10-year-old daughter and said, we need to do something. And now 10 years later, we still are. Constituting America is nonpartisan. And I think one of the most important things that we're up against today when it, when it, when it, it encompasses our founding documents is that people think it's a partisan document. They think, oh, that's for you know, Republicans, it's for conservatives, it's for people from the Tea Party. And they don't realize that it's a nonpartisan document. So we really, really strive to bring Democrats and Republicans and everybody to our organization, independents, to, to say this is why it matters. So we're a multi-tiered uh, foundation. The first thing we have is breaking it down. And we have an annual 90-day study where we bring in scholars and professors, many from Heritage Foundation, all over to write or, uh, articles for us. Um, breaking it down, the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, the important documents of America, and why it really matters. Then we have another um, wonderful 
our most prevalent aspect is the George Washington Speaking Initiative. And this is, we've, we launched this to go into the schools. And of course, it can be very challenging to get into the schools, but we have, and we've given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of speeches in the schools. I have given 99% of these speeches in the schools, all different levels of schools, charter schools, public schools, all different types of schools where I walk in the schools and here's what we do that, that, that I think is so important. We teach the application of the constitution. Um, and we've also, I do many of these that before COVID on Google Hangouts, now it's Zoom, but I actually go into the classrooms on a, and onto a big screen in their classroom so I can teach kids all over America. And the one thing that I think is so important is that they understand, kids think, well, what has it done for me lately? And as we've heard today, they're not really, they may get the basics of education, but they think what's happening in DC is something that they do. They do a bill, they create this, they, they are just doing this. They don't understand that it's, what are they doing? They're doing what's happening on the local level with some, what, on the, with their house of representatives in their neighborhood, they're wanting change. So what I focus on in these speeches is how to do it. I, how, how, and what has it done for me lately? Well, let me show you. So the most important thing I teach them is the first amendment rights, that that's the, those are the tools in their toolbox. And I start with teaching them how, it, what's the order? What's the order? I say, start with a petition. So that when you go, when you end up in your assembly, you know exactly what you want. And I ask kids, what would you like to change? And it's fascinating. I, I get them to think that, and to feel empowered. That wait a minute, what is it done for me? How can I be involved? This is for me. And I say, you're never too young. The 27th Amendment was, the movement was started by a, a student at the University of Texas, Gregory Watson. And so I ask, I say, you're thinking about what you want to change in your neighborhood. And kids will come back to me and say, I want less drugs in the neighborhood. I want I want better protection in the neighborhood. I want a, more more lights. It's dark in my neighborhood. We have potholes in our neighborhood. We want the uh, pool. We want a key to the local pool. We don't want to have to pay twenty dollars. And some kids would say we don't want any immigration. Or, you know, it's, one kid said I want better breaks for small businesses. I mean, it's amazing to hear what the children want. But it doesn't matter what they say. It's what they feel. And if they feel that, they are now understanding why the constitution matters to them why the founding it's all encompassing the abraham lincoln said that the golden apple was the declaration of independence and the the constitution is a silver frame that protects it so i interlock those two things life liberty pursuit of happiness what you need to change the constitution gives that to you and that's why that's important so i teach them how to write a petition we actually write a petition together a title and one or one two three four five six and then i say okay now you use your speech then you call the press and we talk about what press they can call. I'm 15 years old and I've, I'm 12, I've written this petition. You use your speech in the press for help and then you plan your assembly. But now you have flyers, you know exactly what you want. And I also teach them the most important person, we all think it's the president and we run for these presidential elections. But I ask them, can you go talk to the president? Male, female, Democrat, Republican? And they're like, no, I'm like, no, we can't get through the White House. And so I teach them about the representative in their neighborhood, why it matters, the application of our founding documents. And so we look it up. I teach them how to look up their representative, that they can go talk to them, make an appointment with them. They can go to D.C. and walk through security and go through the Capitol to see them and that they take their petition to their representative at whatever age. So it's, it's teaching them how to feel empowered and to vote every two years for that representative. It really matters that that's the person there and that's why a republic matters that's why local local government matters um because when you get national you get lost and government kids feel lost so we focus really on what has it done for me lately and 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 why it matters to them because if they don't understand why it matters to them that's why they don't think it matters right so we have to teach the application of it how you can get those potholes fixed and that might be a local level but that i just teach them based on what they feel. In closing here, we, we um, now have pivoted with these speeches to Zooms. So we have our contest, which I'm gonna close with, but we have kids, Democrats, Republicans from all over. These kids, many of them stay with us for 10 years on our National Youth Advisory Board. We now have constitutional chats that we do on Tuesdays and Saturdays. It's I'm on this, Kathy Gillespie, Tova, Tova who's a 16 year old Kaplan, and Dakari Chapman, who is a 16 year old as well, who just booked a movie with Spike Lee. Um, so these students have been with us for three or four years winning our contest. 
So now we have kids teaching kids with us on these constitutional chats, and we have all these wonderful, wonderful leaders and, and uh, professors and scholars that come on our chats on Tuesdays and Saturdays. We also have a civil civic conversation aspect to our George Washington Speaking Initiative, where we teach kids how to listen to the opposing point of view and why that matters. You know, no one's 100% right and no one's 100% wrong. So we teach the kids global warming. Let's hear both sides. And by the end, the kids who are desperately pro-global warming will think, well, I never thought about this on the other aspects. Maybe global warming isn't that urgent. We teach them how to have a conversation and to read articles from both points of view. So in closing, we teach kids, so we teach kids breaking it down. What has it done for me lately, but how can I make a difference? So we have our We the Future contest where we ask kids from, this is where my arts comes into play, uh, po poetry, artwork, commercials. They film their own commercials, um, uh, short films, songs, and, and we ask them to create STEM projects, marketing plans, and the contest, they win scholarships, they have a mentor trip to DC, because I know Kathy, they get all kinds of great behind the scenes tours of the White House. <laughs> this year they had a 45 minute Q&A with Supreme uh, Court Just, uh, Chief Justice um, Roberts. So it's been an amazing opportunity for these kids. They also win some money, but here is what we do. If you look at the bottom of this here, we actually promote their works. So we don't hire kids or use Madison Avenue. These contest entries, we help promote their careers because if we figure if we can help them get into the culture with an appreciation of the constitution, that's where the impact is made. So we, we've had our songs written by and sung by young kids have played 145 million times on the radio stations across the country. Their PSAs have been on television, 15.6 million viewers on television stations. So we actually promote their winning works and help their careers. So we're gonna close with this to see an actual winning video, 30 seconds with Dakari Chapman. He is one of our, he's the young, young student who just booked a movie. He's an actor with uh, Spike Lee. We also, you can see the billboard there. He's on billboards across the country. We really promote the kids. Um, and they stay with us for 10 years or more. Well, we're going to existence for 10 years. For many of them stay with us for 10 years. So here's, here's his winning PSA. It's only 30 seconds and it's been on television. Hey you, stop and listen. This is a public service announcement with Dakari Chapman. Why should you know your constitution and why should you know your rights as a US citizen? How would you like it if someone didn't allow your club to meet at your house? I wouldn't because that's not cool. How would you like to be tried without a jury? I wouldn't because that's not cool. These things are not cool. Learn your rights as a U.S. citizen so you know what to do in these situations. Thanks for listening. And remember, it's an American thing, so learn it. Did y'all see all that? Did it play all 30 seconds? Okay, good. I didn't get to see that. Okay. Well, anyway, I think I'm beyond my three minutes. So thank you so much. And it's constitutingamerica.org. And you can see the young students and how they then feel empowered that it's nonpartisan. Many of the students that we work with are Democrats, but now they're learning that, wait a minute, we're not a democracy. We're actually a republic. Uh, so it's, it's great to, to work with these students. And thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Janine, and thank you to, to all of our panelists. Um, incredible work that you're doing. Absolutely incredible work. As we transition to the discussion, I want to invite you to submit your questions in the question box uh, on the webinar dashboard. And in this transition, we're going to take a look at another video that will highlight um, the, the workings of, of social justice education. And so take a look at the screen to get a glimpse at the power and the workings of social justice education. The Never Again movement wasn't formed in a vacuum. It's riding on the most recent wave of youth activism, which picked up speed around 2010. Student protests ebbed after the anti-war movement of the 60s and 70s. Young people today are getting involved to change systemic inequalities they were raised to believe had already been taken care of. The Dreamers, Students Against Sexual Assault, Occupy Wall Street, and the Black Lives Matter movement 
all had strong involvement by college-educated millennials. Never Again is leveraging social networks to mobilize faster than most movements before it, according to experts who study the rise of social and political movements. One week after the shooting, the Never Again Twitter handle is verified and has more than 81,000 followers. In just a few days, student leaders have crowdsourced more than $3 million through online campaigns and celebrity donations. They're also handling their own crisis control by directly responding to critics. So, so Dr. Lindsay, you know, you also served as staff director um, for the National Endowment of Humanities Signature Initiative, We the People, uh, which supports teaching and scholarship in American history and, and culture. And Elizabeth, um, as a former school board member, between the two of you, you've witnessed firsthand the workings of, of social justice education. Want to spend a couple of minutes um, really trying to help people peel back the onion on this so that they can understand exactly what we mean when we say social justice education, the danger of it, and how it kind of creeps into the into the bloodstream um, of of K through 12 and, and even higher education. So, Dr. Lindsay, over to you first, and then to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Angela. Uh, social justice goes under the broader category that we're hearing more and more today called action civics. It also mm -hmm. goes under the names of civic engagement, project-based learning civics. All of it, what it argues is that students, in order to better understand America, need not to simply do book learning or as the Obama Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, called your grandmother's civics, and instead turn to what is called doing civics. Now, these organizations that promote this say that this is non-political. We just completed a massive study of the sorts of projects that go under the name Action Civics across the country. Bottom line, all it is, is teaching students how to protest in favor of progressive political causes. There is no appreciation of the founding documents except to dismiss them as the sham rationalizations of white male property holders. This is what we're up against right now. And even in my state of Texas, and people think, well, in Texas, this isn't as big a problem. That's not true. Action Civics bills were passed in the Texas House in the last two sessions. The good news is the Senate didn't hear them, but this is a movement that's pushing harder and harder. And we have to be very leery of this argument. Well, we just wanna teach students how to do civics so that they can learn better. Look, we know our students are civically illiterate. Let's first teach them what our principles are and then there are very proper ways for them to go out and do civics, but understanding the founding has got to be in the driver's seat. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Uh, over to you, Elizabeth. I mean, this is this is a real serious issue, uh, and as we know, teachers are are also saying, "I, I, I got to engage the students. I've got to make it exciting and fun." And, and Janine Turner has shown us how we can do that. Uh, in, the, in, 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 in a productive way. So Elizabeth, give us a little more insight on how this resonates from school boards back to the teachers in the classroom. Well, I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna go right back to what I was saying earlier, the, the criticality of a school board um, and how it directs the leadership and how it directs the superintendent to operationally guide civics. You can have civic engagement the, what Dr. Lindsay was talking about, the civic action, is actually really subverting civics. Um, it takes away from um, a, a foundational understanding of the rights of students by suppressing the rights of other students, by, uh, sadly, teachers suppressing the rights of students. You're seeing a, a national movement that is action-oriented of getting um, embedded into a school calendar days off um, for protesting, 
And that's going all the way down sometimes to not just uh, high school and middle school, but even elementary school. And how do you um, how do you engage civically on issues of importance, regardless of where it is on the spectrum, um, when you have you know a, basically a leftist pull to drive students to you know act um, in such a way that's largely um, financed and heavily funded by um, some hard left organizations and, and individuals. And so there's a, a very hard influence of money into this. It's not just, it's not organic. Um, and when students are influenced, unfortunately, in the classroom, their, their voices are suppressed in terms of the types of books they want to read, um, the types of reports they want to write. Um, I have sco endless scores, not just from Fairfax County, but from around the country. People have contacted me, um, giving me copies of assignments, you know, snapshots of things that, the, that their children were asked to write about. Um, or students themselves who have said, you know, I was influenced in how I wrote in the classroom, um, the types of presentations I chose, even how I wrote my essays for my SAT, um, that I did not want to be negatively penalized. And this is, this is uncivic education. This is an uncivic approach. And um, it, it is really incumbent, not just on parents of children in the school system, but of members of the community, because if, you, if we lose the opportunity to understand what civic education means and to understand history in context, then you lose the opportunity to have well-educated adults um, who are going to become successive teachers, um, the successive business leaders, the successive leaders in government. Thank you. Beth, I want to get you in on, on this part of the discussion uh, in, in terms of, you know, paying for us a real, in real time, having conversations with parents and, and helping them to understand, you know, the danger of this and then being able to prompt them into um, an awareness to protect against it. Well, I would have to say that uh, we, we send out a biweekly email blast. And one of the most powerful things that we do is share examples that people send us of the type of assignments that Elizabeth's talking about, because they kind of speak for themselves. Um, oftentimes, they are very um, left, like ideological in nature. Um, they're rarely balanced. And some of them, you know, and it goes in several different areas. Sometimes it's race, sometimes it's LGBT, sometimes it's climate change. So they kind of run the gamut. Um, as far as the revisionist history, I mean, in one of my children's um, APUSH classes, AP US History, Columbus was literally described as just a white male. I mean, said by the teacher. So in some cases, it's not even subtle. It's fairly um, obvious. And, uh, and, and it's really something that you need to, you really need to stay connected with your kids. Um, and then uh, when something arises, um, I send emails uh, to the school, to the teacher, to address it first at that level. Um, and I encourage other parents to do so uh, because otherwise I think it, it goes unchecked. Um, and then also to the school board. I think it, when you copy your school board, you tend to get the attention of administration. And, um, and that's how it should be. That's, that's the school board's role is to oversee the people that are running the school. So. Thank you, Beth. Janine, I'm, I'm gonna pull you in, but I wanna kind of take the conversation in a slightly different direction. Uh, you know, your passion for America and the founding fathers um, and, and, and the founding of this incredible organization. You are in contact and in the way that you talk about how you engage with the students is so powerful. But how do you de deal with the, the, these issues um, as a nonpartisan organization um, that's safeguarding, you know, at the same time against the things that are threats um, to to a good, full, healthy understanding. Uh, how do you how do you do that head on with the kids? Your mic, your mic's off. <laughs> okay. When I do my constitution, when I constitutional chats, I'm the host, so I'm never muted. So this is why it's, I'm I'm doing this. Um, I think it's really important to not preach to the choir and to make sure that we can reach the kids that are being taught only one point of view. Um, I find this incredibly, incredibly 
uh, worrisome that that in a way students and millennials and the Z and social media they're being indoctrinated with simply one point of view um and i'm talking about on an issue here say um reason comes from being able to hear both points of view and we're up against this tidal wave in not only the school system but in society and in the culture uh, to 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 combat this and to hear why to hear another point of view about these things and why and if we're talking about the constitution and the founding documents why that actually matters my daughter is 22 she's conservative she uh was the president of the republican association at rice university she just got accepted to harvard law school um but i feel like i have to constantly sort of feed her you know do you know do you know the other side because i know that she's not with social media and the ch group chats and everything that she's on she's not hearing always the other side <laughs> so um it, it's important to make sure it's, it's difficult in schools i think uh, teachers are up against uh a lot of pressure so i think it, it starts not only with the schools but it starts in your home it starts it starts with grandparents teaching grandchildren with parents teaching their children with with teaching the nieces and nephews and i love acting but i love what i do to go into these classrooms and i i'm so thankful for the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of schools and 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 teachers that have let me talk to their to their students uh, about why the founding principles really matter, why it matters, why a republic matters. You know, if if we go out and en masse have have these protests, and and we it's it's dangerous. It can lead to a tyrant. It can it, well, protests are fine. We we have the right to assemble, but but if we don't couple this with what the Constitution teaches us, which is legislation, which is representation which is to take the passion, calm it down, now let the representatives take it to, to the Congress for us, let it go through the process so that we then have legislation that's long lasting or an amendment. Kids don't know really anything about the amendment process. So the assemblies that we see are what I teach the students are just part of what the constitution gives us. If all of our representatives have to swear to protect the constitution, to constitution not to protect the people, but to protect the constitution because they know the constitution protects us um and just to understand the tools and why they matter if you're upset about something kids just think they have to go out and hate america and and protest wait a minute you have the power to change and the, but it's through a thought provoking you know process with through a republic with representatives but you can start a movement through the petition which i was talking about earlier for an amendment and I'll close with my response to this. Many people don't know there are two ways to amend. If Congress, I talked to this with the kids, if Congress, this is in the Constitution, two ways to amend, they don't want to limit their terms. They don't want to balance the budget. What happens if we have an out of control government, not just with the presidency, which everyone thinks it would be the presidency. What if we have out of control legislation where we could have and we can amend the Constitution through the states? through the convention of states. Wonderful, wonderful loophole our founders gave us. For So there's so much power, actually, with the checks and balances within the documents, and they just don't understand that. Treaties is another one. Treaties are now called executive agreements, and they don't have to be ratified by the Congress. So the president can go over, I tell them, the president can go over and say, hey, I, we're going to give all of our weapons to, 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 you know, North Korea. He's a nice guy. I think he needs them. Um, wait a minute, we need a say in that. But when it's an executive agreement, the, the Senate doesn't have to ratify. So I, I walk through the tools about why the Constitution actually matters and the founding documents actually matter. Well, well good insight there in, in terms of us not running away from the, the other side um, uh, and, and pushing back and leaning in to, to uh, have those discussions, especially since we know that those founding documents and guiding kids in that direction is, is the right way to go. Uh, and, and, and once people see the truth and the, 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 the greatness of, of those foundations they'll embrace. Want to remind you to uh, put your questions in the dialogue box um, and we're gonna go take a question now. Um, Sean Riley, who is Director of Veterans Affairs 
uh, or veterans programs at the philanthropy roundtable uh, wants to know how you all see um, uh, veterans playing a role uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, educating awareness um, and engaging uh, with young people over civics. So Beth, let's go to you. Um, well, I, I am a huge fan of storytelling as a way to convey lessons, and I can't think of a better storyteller than a veteran to tell us what they fought for, how, how, how it was on the ground, and just their beliefs in American values and, and what the country stands for. So I think there's a huge role to mobilize veterans um, in a variety of ways. They could also be mentors. They can um, just forge relationships, especially with this younger generation. Um, who really has not seen the threat of war, at least not, not as, as the veterans who have fought in our past wars have. So um, absolutely an education. Thank you, thank you. We've got another one um, from Philanthropy Roundtable from Adam Kizzle. And Dr. Lindsay, I'll direct this one to you. He says, the children's children of President Reagan's generation are already with us, but how might President Reagan perceive civil society and civil education in America today? I'm afraid to say that I think he would regard it as broken. And all of the data that we have about civic literacy uh, would confirm that. And it's even worse than that. Our first summer institute for civics teachers that we did last summer, we had an eighth grade civics teacher. And in Texas, the last time students studied the founding in high school, in, in K-12, is in eighth grade. And she told our class, she said that by the time students are middle school age, they come to class already cynical about the American regime. Now that shocked me, but these are the people in the trenches, right, doing the hard work. So I asked the rest of the class, I said, do you agree? And they said, yes, and it gets worse every year. Right. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that it's not simply that they're being uh, not taught properly in K-12. That's too often the case. But this is by the time they're middle school age. Right. The culture itself, TV, movies, music, everything around us teaches that America is a fundamentally unjust country. Right. So I'm old enough to remember the 60s when that movement became powerful. But at that time, it represented the counterculture. Right? We were still dominated by our World War II veterans, right? The best among us. Right? Today, we're the counterculture. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. So we're going to take one more question, and then I'm going to um, have each of you just give us like a 20-second um, thought for the day that you want to make sure for each person leaves from this webinar remembering. William Dink, uh, a member of Sons of the American Revolution in Fairfax County, writes, we have a program where we go to fourth grade classrooms in the colonial uniforms uh, with all the, the, the flags from US history and explain the history, um, and they explain the history. Fairfax County schools, however, refuse to let them in. So uh, Elizabeth, can you give him some insight on uh, what they can do to change this and how they can become more a part of the curriculum? So um, that's very difficult because we're going back right to the, the people who have control over that. Um, this isn't the US Department of Education. It's not your state um, superintendent. Um, that's gonna be your local school board. And the difficulty is going to be if your school board um, leans left or hard left um, or completely left, uh, you, you're never going to get in. And so if you don't engage, as I said, you know, civic education starts with civic participation. If you don't engage at the front end and control um, and have a voice of who gets on that school board, um, your, your voice is going to be shut out. And the power of omission is just as a, a, a much of a problem in education. It's not just what we're um, 
what what is being taught or what is being changed, but is what is being omitted. And understanding history and context, we're watching this on a national level um, be destroyed. And if you don't understand not only the the American exceptionalism of what we've done well, but what we haven't done well. Um, and understand why people fought um, from, you know, either uh, the story narratives um, that could happen in a live reenactment like that, or from the books themselves. If students are only getting, you know, 30 second TikToks um, and, and Snapchats and, uh, you know, the sound bites that are provided by Hollywood, um, that are provided by George Soros, that are provided by mainstream media, that all have a intended narrative, that there is only going to be one outcome. There is no discernment anymore. There is no um, thought going into how you continue to shape our country going forward. You are stuck on one side of a narrative. And so um, I feel I feel um, bad that if anyone who is attempting to participate in civic education in the classroom on a volunteer basis is shut out, um, instead of, you know, a, an open debate to allow and inform children that we, we are going to have uninformed young adults um, in, in going forward. Thank you so much. You know, this has been an incredible conversation, discussion. Uh, we here at the Heritage Foundation greatly appreciate every single person who's participated uh, in this webinar and to our distinguished panelists, we thank you so much for um, spending this time with us today and also for the work that we're doing with you uh, through the Fulner Institute. And we want to continue to keep people uh, abreast of, of developments that are happening in, in, in your leadership and, and, and through your organizations. And so we will continue to bolster that. As I turn, um, I'm going to turn the call back over to Andy, but first I want to let each one of you give like a 10 second, you know, pillar statement uh, to encourage all the participants to walk away with. So Dr. Lindsay, we'll start with you. Well, we've heard a lot of bad news today about civic illiteracy, but the good news is we can win this because we're the side that doesn't have to run away from the truth. The truth is on our side. We have to remember that and be confident. We just have to stand up and say it. Elizabeth Schultz. Um, I am from the government and I'm here to help. You know, the, the nine most dangerous words from Ronald Reagan. If you rely on the government to teach your children, and relegate 51 million um, children in K through 12 public education without becoming engaged as a parent, as a taxpayer, as a community member, you're gonna keep getting what you got. And frankly, it's our fault. We have yielded public education um, to, uh, to the left for decades. And what we are seeing is um, the, the fruit, um, the you know potentially the poison fruit of those um, of that long period of time of ignoring it. And it is up to each individual listening um, and to pass on the criticality of engaging in and understanding what the children in the United States of America are being taught in public classrooms. Beth Feely, over to you. Thank you. So I, I would encourage um, everyone participating, please do check out 1776unites.com for more information on that group. And along the lines of New Turn Neighbors, I'll just say that we really, when we formed it, we looked at it as a template. Uh, we would love to see, insert name here, neighbors across the United States. So if that idea is of interest, check out that website. Um, if that is something you wanna start in your area, we are happy to for you to go to school on what we did and help. Um, and there is an email contact box. But I think really at a grassroots level, that participation is crucial. Um, and this is a mechanism and a format that can help, so. And Janine Turner will close it out with you and then over to Andy. I remember to unmute this time. Yay! <laughs> okay, well, I will just say that if we're going to reach the, the rising generations, I believe it's really important that, that they understand how it affects them. 
um, in their lives? How is it applicable to me? Why do the founding documents matter? Why do checks and balances matter? Why do the founding principles matter? And when they can understand that, that, it, that it prevents tyranny, which they all don't want, um, and that it helps empower them for change in a way that's reasonable and rational, cool and methodical, that the founding principles aren't to be shunned, they are to be appreciated because it actually, if they can understand that it empowers them, that's the most important thing. And how is that done? I think it's done by affecting the culture. And so that's one of the things we're trying to do to get on the television screens, into the music, you know, out there. Um, and the, it, to try to get into the schools, which we've, we've been really pretty successful with doing because we make sure they understand that we're teaching the principles of the Constitution, not some radical right wing organization. And that way we can get, actually get into the schools and they understand that we we're, we're speaking to every every American because the Constitution, when it was written, truly was a nonpartisan document. It's just here to with enumerated powers, small government to protect our liberties. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Andy, back to you. Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, I wish we could have gotten a closing comment from you, but we had your leadership throughout the session. I thank everybody for their comments today and for the work that you do every day. I had the benefit of, of listening to this and, uh, you know, Tom, to your team at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, the way you frame and advance these policy reforms. Thank you for that. Thank you to Elizabeth for the playbook for the local engagement and to Beth experience of the initial spark and then the, the great way that you've had ongoing initiatives with great leaders like Bob Woodson and then Janine, the work that you and Kathy Gillespie do to get the next generation engaged cognitively and emotionally on the spirit and promise of America. And then really, Angela, thank you to the Fuller Institute and you for leading this conversation today and shaping it nationally on behalf of Heritage. We thank everybody else for joining us. It's hard to get to all the questions. We thank you for them. Please feel free to email me directly, andrew.alabastro at heritage.org, and we will follow up. We appreciate the ongoing audience feedback that we receive. Please visit heritage.org. Please visit resourcebank.org for these recordings and upcoming programs. And I will close by quoting Dakari Chapman's public service announcement. It's an American thing, so learn it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>